Okay, Cordula. Hi, everyone. I'm here in the south of Germany, near Basel, near Bern. And funnily enough, today I just walked into um, Michael Höger, who is the secretary of the Gapsa Gesellschaft Bern, who was on his home way. That's why he's not here now with his family to Bern from Dortmund. So I should greet you all. I guess he will be here later. And um, yeah, what's going on in Europe? I mean, I can just speak for Switzerland and Germany, more or less. Um, but it's quite exciting what's going on. Um, so we're not having a regional group. As you know, in Bern, there's the Gepse Gesellschaft with Rudi and Michael as the secretary. And um, that work in general at the moment is to translate books and take care of the archive. But um, we've been busy in my job, which I will hold only for another two months in the Integral Forum in Germany, translating Jeremy's work and Aaron's work into articles and um, the resonance has been really big, which is quite interesting that English translations into German <laughs> seem more well received than Gepsa himself <laughs> as being read in books. Um, nevertheless, um, I guess that's thanks to your wonderful personalities, Aaron and Jeremy. Um, yeah, there's exciting stuff happening. So, um, we are trying very hard to get Jeremy's books into German. So we have Tom Amark from Parallax Magazine and Phenomen Verlag, who would be very happy to translate this work. And the Gepse Gesellschaft in Bern would love to have this like as a standard, also introductory work for the younger generation. And so um, only today I talked to Michael about this. So there's funding and it seems all happening and good. So hopefully soon um, the German readers can read your wonderful book and the coming to be books um, in German. And then, um, yeah, Aaron and I have been working on a masterpiece. <laughs> We're bringing out a magazine called Akronon, Akronon um, about Zeitfreiheit. And um, so this magazine is launching next week with a website and a landing page. And we aim to build a German friend circle of um, Gibsarians and people who um, are active in um, the realms of politics, ecology, psychology, spirituality, um, education, art, especially also. And so, Aaron and I have been working on this and now it's finished and it's coming out and it's hopefully also in print, not just in online, it's in German and in English. And we hope to establish a circle of friends in the German speaking Gapsa um, field who like to work with us um, in creating a new, newer generation of people um, following up Gebs's work, basically, and integral consciousness. So um, this is happening and hopefully Aaron will be in place here soon when he can leave his country and work here close by. I, I leave that to you, Aaron, to add a few words also about the magazine. And then um, what else is happening? Uh, I guess you would need to ask me if you have questions, but in general, it's a quite exciting time. We have an integral politic in Switzerland and Michael is coaching, giving the strategy as a Gebsarian keynote speaker to them. So there's a lot of teachings politically to the political party in Switzerland, um, to the integral party from Gebs's realm. So Michael is doing a fantastic job there quite busy and um, so we try to bring Gebs's, um idea basically back home because the Swiss don't really know him much I guess in America you probably know more about him than here and it's wonderful we have a political party and we have educational systems 
and artists and philosophers who now kind of in the last year catch up on and start really being interested in John Gebser. And um, so Jeremy, your work has been helpful. You've been holding classes for us, for the German audience and they've been really well received. And I guess that's also something we could discuss that is strange that it needs an American to come to explain <laughs> to us more about Gebser, but partly that's also because of your generation. So yeah, I think it's a generation problem here right now that um, because the archive has been superb in really, um, as Michael just told me before, really um, taking care of Joe's especially wish for Rudi to really take care of the archive. And he's done that incredibly. Um, however, it's been more like a librarian work or ar archive work. And my aim here in Basel is to, to bring it to life now and bring it to new and bring it to fresh and bring it out in the street and bring it out to young people so they can follow up. So Aaron, maybe you just want to add a few words about how you perceive your linkage to the <laughs> European <laughs> family. Wow, yeah, I guess my linkage to the European Gebserians goes back to 2005 when I, I was a PhD student and I traveled to uh, Switzerland for the, was for the um, centennial, the 100 year anniversary of Gebs's birth. And it was uh, a conference held in Bern. So I met, I met Rudolf Hamily there and I had access to the Gebser archive to do some research to some of Gebs's um, letters and, you know, Nachlass. So, um, and also that's when I, that's when I literally lugged back the entire um, collected works of Gebser <laughs> in my suitcase um, back to the Antipodes. So, um, but yeah, I've, I've, I've kept in touch since then and, uh, but yeah, in more recent times, um, more has been happening. And it's, it's like Cordula said, it's very strange that um, the English speaking world has to explain Gebza to Germans. You know, it, it's surreal. Uh, and I think it's partly because um, Gebza remains relatively unknown. And, but Ken Wilbur is you know, translated into German, he's, he's very popular, much more popular. So people are getting kind of turned on to the integral idea uh, through German translations of Wilbur and, and integral theory in general. And then people like us are going, hold on, if you want to go deeper and more interesting, you can look here, you know, so. Uh, but yeah, we, um, but with, with that comes a whole, um, desire also to to bring the inter integral idea out of its developmental straitjacket and to bring the more poetic artistic and and i would say mystical dimensions of gabza into into play and i guess that's that's kind of the emphasis of my work you know bringing the poet the poesis and the, the mystical non-duality back uh into into dialogue, because I think to me, I, I personally think that is the core of it. It's certainly where Gebza started, but uh, yeah, more could be said. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, and thank you. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you, Cordula, for sharing a little bit about uh, very exciting developments and um, just very much looking forward to seeing Ikranon uh, coalescing, coming together, materializing. So. Um, I think we do have a few questions actually for uh, Aaron or, or, or Cordula, you, you might uh, be able to answer this, but Karen, I see you, you raised your hand. Actually, before Karen, we jump to you, I'll just mention that um, our panel with Aaron and Rudolf Hammerly is going to be starting in about uh, 20 minutes or so. We're going to start 15 minutes earlier than was on the updated schedule. So that would be 1145 um, Pacific and uh, 145 Eastern, I believe. So just letting you know. Um, all right. So Karen, would you like to ask your question about? 
Yes, thank you. This is actually a chance to ask a question I've been wondering about. It plugs right into what both of you, Aaron and Cordula, were saying. Uh, Cordula, I'm thrilled to hear about the acronon and what you're doing. Uh, just as a background, I, when I was doing my dissertation research back in the late 70s and early 80s, I lived in Munich for two and a half years. So I used to speak fluent German. So I'm interested for my purposes in nailing down um, this surprisingly wiggly term, the Ursprung und Gegenwart, I think that, that was Gebser's title for his uh, book, right? Ursprung und Gegenwart. Mm. That was his title that was translated into ever present origin for the English title is do I have that co factually correct that's that's correct yeah okay because this gets to a point you made about kind of bringing Gebser back and, and getting out of that developmental straitjacket which kind of through Ken Wilbur that's kind of how most of us know him, but getting back into the artistic the cultural history the and the spiritual aspect now I, I've been asking myself, what was Gebser's term for ever-present origin? Because Ursprung und Gegenwart means origin and the present. But the translation into the English title, the ever-present origin, takes a very important step in saying that the origin is ever-present. Every moment in yeah. this moment is the moment of creation, which is a very important, very mystical Insight. So the translation into the English title already takes a step beyond Gebser's title. And I'm wondering now if did Gebser have a term himself in German for the ever present origin, meaning that the origin that is present in every moment, or is, is that a step that the English translator took? Cordula, uh, do you want me to take that one? Uh, I, I can answer that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I will, but I just challenge you, Aaron. Zeitfreiheit. <laughs> <laughs> Zeitfreiheit, <laughs> yes. Okay. To, to translate it into your ever present origin into German would be, and you know, I, I'm not it's, a native speaker, it'd be clunky. It would be das immer gegenwärtliche Ursprung, which is yeah, awfully yeah. clunky. So, yeah, well, that's the thing. So, I think he does use that term, you know, gegenwärtiger Ursprung. And but yeah, the title is Ursprung und Gegenwart. And, uh -huh. um, but Gegenwärtliche you, Ursprung would work. Okay. So, um, but the, the thing is, um, Gebser himself, um, he, he published an English translation, which I think he either did himself or he worked on with someone else. Oh, really? Of a chapter from Ursprung und Gegenwart, uh, in a in a in, in an academic journal of some kind, and so in writing in translating that chapter, he already gave us the English language, some of the English language we needed, you know, to translate things. So so he, I think he used um, the term "ever present origin" in that piece. So that was his chosen so that translation kind of his, into English. Yeah, and he of course he is a translator among other things. He translated. Uh, Rilke and Lorca and a lot of Spanish poetry and a lot, a lot of things actually. Uh, so he was very sensitive to, you know, choices in translation. So yeah, the idea of Ursprung und Gegenwart as yeah, immer gegenwärtiger, ever present Ursprung is, uh, it does have, it's not just a poetic, license it, it is uh, sorry it's not just a translator's uh liberty it's a uh it comes from gebser himself okay thank you and and what uh, and what was the term that gebser himself used in english the ever-present origin i believe so yeah okay okay that, that that answers my technical question but i was so i i wasn't even going to bother you folks with this little niggle of personal interest but it just tied right into what you were saying aaron about the mystical oh, dimensions of, of Gebser, which is, yeah, is no, one of the... This, I, I um, don't apologize. It's, it's not a, a, I don't find it a, you know, a niche matter. It's kind of crucial. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Kind of the, the question, right? <laughs> um, yeah, fantastic. And, and again, thank you, Cordula, for, uh, for giving us a little bit of update what's, what's happening in, in Europe. And um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to be in touch about 
um, that translation work. Again, I'm so excited. This is all news for me as well. So we'll talk about it and we'll see uh, um, how this can all materialize. But yeah, fantastic. Um, any other questions for, for yeah. Cordula? Or? I, I, I just wanted to make a comment, Royce here. Um, and I don't mean it as a joke, but this Americans bringing Gebser back to the German speaking world. My understanding is that the the very early Mick Jagger, Keith Richards combination, um, their mission was to bring great black music back to America yeah. and it succeeded. So I think I just wanted to offer that as a, as a model of, yeah. of potential. And, thank and you. the French brought tango back to Argentina. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, uh, Aaron, you and I have our work cut out for us in terms of bringing uh, Anglo literature to to uh, the German language. <laughs> bringing, bringing the origin back. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, John. I will make my appeal again for a new translation of uh, the Invisible Origin. I bring this up every time I see you, Aaron. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 coming. <laughs> uh, just a, a couple of notes. Um, it does strike me this is the first Gibbser conference in the third decade of the twenty first century. Okay. Okay. So what are what are, for what it's worth? Uh, oh, yes, it, always in uh, Gibbser conferences, the arts have been uh, in, integrated. Uh, included uh, all, all the arts, really, uh, even in, in my uh, tenure, uh, uh, music, dance, performance, and of course, poetry. Uh, it's very hard, I find, when I'm introducing Gibson to somebody who has no knowledge, uh, and maybe the rest of you also can explain, well, he was a philosopher, he was a scholar, he was a this, he was a cultural historian, he was... Uh, but then I always start with he 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 was actually a poet, uh, and then uh, you know and all all uh, I love his description of poetry as the history of the dateless, uh, and that opens into the the temporix, uh, which I I think is so important. But today we have a, uh, poetry. Um, Aaron is going to bring us. Uh, some of Gebser's poetry, how, how wonderful that Aaron has translated. I don't know of those, of course, who are tuned in now, who, who may be getting an introduction to Gebser. In some ways, the conference is the best, and in some ways, it's not necessarily the best way to get an introduction to Gebser, because those of us who are used to sort of conversing this way can move through various language structures that may be new if, uh, if there's anyone here for whom this is introduction, uh, welcome, uh, you can find a home here. Uh, I, I will introduce uh, Aaron uh, briefly to say, of course, Aaron was president of our society at uh, once upon a time, uh, one of the wonderful personalities, uh, as someone said a few moments ago. Uh, Aaron studied classical Sanskrit, German, Greek, Religious Studies, Philosophy, and Classics at the University of Queensland. And I believe you're in Australia today. Is that right, Aaron? I'm in New Zealand. Yeah, I'm right in New Zealand. I, I, I can't figure but out. I, I, I was in Australia, yes. Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, research interests in phenomenology of consciousness, non-dual currents in Eastern and Western philosophy, the traditional hieratic sciences, uh, research concentrating on the deep interstices between integral and hermetic philosophy, uh, believing that philosophy must go hand in hand with higher modes of experiential a perception. So uh, that's from the that's from the uh, online bio. But uh, I don't. You want to add to your own introduction, Aaron? Oh, that's that's already over ambitious enough. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Uh, how, how wonderful to, to be together. And uh, uh, it's you and Gates are now. Okay. Let me get my. 
document up. Uh, so I'm going to read uh, a, the introductory passages from Gebze's Rose Poem, which he wrote in 1945 into 1946. And before I, before I begin that, I just want to point out that um, Gebze's Rose Poem itself is kind of his answer to Rilke's famous epitaph. So long before Rilke died, Rilke wrote the lines that he wanted engraved on his own gravestone. And those lines were, Rose, O oh pure contradiction, lust to be no one's sleep beneath so many lids. And this, this epitaph of Rilke's, um, the, you know, this idea that there's a consciousness beneath the sleeping lids of the rose, and that these, these are so many veils for a deathless awareness that persists eternally beneath all sleep, dreaming and waking. You know, it's, it's almost this Turiya-like uh, awareness subsisting underneath all forms of consciousness. Uh, and, and Rilke's hinting at this, you know, uh, very obliquely in his, in his very short poem. And, and uh, you know, I think this is exactly where Gebser picks up with his rose poem. So uh, let's get to it. Release, release, dissolve and relinquish the bonds of heaven and earth. From Persian roots, she grows to you, and upon the cross, she blooms. Full of transparency, the rose beyond the heavens. Imagine the lilac's heart-shaped petals to grasp it in full measure, this early attempt by nature herself to dare the form of the innermost human voice. And thanks to this, your heart, remelted in the coldness and radiance of running tears, lost the exquisitely numbing scent of the syringa and emerged into the gentle diaphaneity of things. See too the soft colored lotus, this blooming of water, this delicate flowering of sleep and death, echo of the preformed image within, which grew out of dreaming and into a flower, a nocturnal fluorescence, mirrored in the waxing moonlike smile of the sublime. But the entwining rose is the further awakened form, already surpassing appearance, the brightest of all blossomings, whose diaphanous splendor entrusts itself to the winds as the freer form. And sometimes when the softened winds allot their luminous symmetry, their equilibrium to heaven and earth, you stand in its earthly and heavenly flow, knowing the diaphanous hour, the rose. I could go on. I'm not sure how we are with time, but uh, we could also we could also just leave it there. Got about yeah. nine minutes or so, so uh, it's up to you, Aaron, if you want to. I can go in a little bit. Mm. Uh, let's see. The eye, however, raises her up beyond flower and fruit, gently absorbing the heart. And so she grows out of the mediating realm. She grows out of the in-between into distances that no eye can see. For they become transparent as does the world when we become transparent ourselves. From that rose petaled transparency which already advances ahead of its own reflection. So too is our innermost knowing always beyond us. 
that this divine repose restores us and perhaps dissolves itself in an eternal blooming high above the head and in darkening hours returns to us. Whatever we have thought and done all comes back magnified by us or diminished. For everyone still broods on the smallest gestures of giving and taking, which made their world greater or smaller. Perhaps he catches one of them with time enough to change things and thus himself. But even the most honest act, even here in the concision of words, we still falsify. The rare purity of every rose serves as a pretense and parable. But all roses suffer the secretion of significations. And we can only hope that in the effortless form of greater release that already undulates over us, all this human tribulation will be increasingly transparent and transfigure itself. That's, um, and that's the first section of the Rose poem, which is a, a much longer poem. Um, Gebzer wrote, he wrote about five or maybe six long form poems in the 1940s, which were his poetic lead in to the ever present origin, which he I think published in 19, the first volume of, uh, at least in 1949. So um, many of these poems start articulating this, what, what I think is his kind of non-dual awareness. He's, a, he's often breaking down dualities um, in these poems. Dualities of, of, the duality is of death and life, you know, um, spatial dualities of distance, near, nearness and farness, the dualities of time, past and future. Um, all the dualities he talks about as necessary to overcoming for the attainment of integral consciousness. Uh, he starts, we, we start getting in a poetic exploration of these in, um, in these poems. So, uh, yes. Okay, thank, thank you, thank you, Aaron. Uh, thank you. Uh, we'll move to Sabrina's poem. Uh, 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 did we want to get, uh, Karen had a question. Uh, yes, uh, only, only if there's time, because I, well, I, I don't want to take too much of the time here. We're a little well, why, why, don't, why don't we wait, because we're, we're getting kind of tight. Uh, uh, Sabrina Dalaval uh, is an experimental writer and a new podcast producer. Uh, she teaches writing uh, there in Florida. She is the vice president of our society. She can't be with us today, but she has uh, created a, uh, an installation sound call, uh, for a Message in a Bottle, which is based in Washington, D.C. I'm going to read myself Sabrina's poem before we uh, hear her production of it, I think that will make it easier for you to, to connect. Um, so I will read a very straight reading of the poem, uh, which is very brief, and then we will have Sabrina's production. Uh, this is exactly where we left off with, with Aaron and Gabe, sir. Uh, you are a sky, an open space wrapped around the world, making light possible like long deep breaths returning 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 with sudden change the wind and the falling wet bending earth and the cracked whip of electric charge shaking 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 with clouds clinging to the ground slowly creeping away from the water blowing at sunset with all the colors inside your skin. You are sky, the deep blue that bleeds into night, 
in absolute stillness that is your own true body. Are we going to do Casia now? Or? No. Okay. So we have we have another performance with Casia uh, that will come up later. I understand. Yeah, Jeremy, would you like to transition us into our keynote? Um, hang on. Let me. Uh, 